if you're doing emergency work, you see just horrible stuff and you know, you experience that that kind of trauma and you also have your own difficulties. And there's a lot of different strategies to integrate that trauma rather than disintegrate. You know, when you integrate it, it's like, okay, I'm I'm gonna be all right. When you disintegrate it, then it accumulates, right? The difference between stress, which is resolved after the event, and trauma, which you keep stuffing in there like a stuff sack. Hi, folks. I'm Dan Dworkis, and this is the Emergency Mind Podcast, a space where we bring together lessons from the emergency department and beyond about performance when it matters the most and applying knowledge under pressure. Our guest this episode is Dr. Rob Orman. Rob is an emergency physician, an educator, a coach, and a phenomenally deep thinker. He did medical school at Emory University and his emergency medicine residency at Denver Health. Then he spent 20 years as a community emergency physician before becoming a full-time executive coach. Rob is the former chief editor of MRAP. He's the creator of the Stimulus and ERCast podcasts. And for nearly a decade, he served as the host of Essentials of Emergency Medicine, the largest single-track EM conference in the world. If you want to learn more about Rob, and you should, you can find his team, Orman Physician Coaching, at roborman.com. That's R-O-B-O-R-M-A-N.com. Now, I loved talking to Rob in this episode. We get deep into growing as a physician or an operator, both within and across roles and times in our life. We talk about the decision-making around when to transition between jobs, but equally importantly, we talk about the decision to lean in and productively change the environment wherever we're working now. There's a lot in here no matter where you are in your personal arc. Before we get started, a quick reminder, if you want to join individuals and teams around the world who are working to perform better during times of crisis and emergency, there are so many ways to get involved in the Emergency Mind Project community, and we would love to have you. The easiest way to get started is to take the free crisis skills test, which you can find at emergencymind.com. Okay, all that said, let's jump into this awesome episode with Dr. Rob Orman. I hope you enjoy. Well, Rob, thank you for coming on the podcast and, and flipping seats with me for a little bit. I've been honored to be a guest on on your show uh, twice now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Two and a half times if we count the half time that we like couldn't really get off the ground for whatever reason. But I'm psyched to have you on this side of the fence and to be sitting down and talking to you again. So thanks for coming. This is such a treat. I've been excited about this for a while. I mean... I know that yes, you have been a guest on on Stimulus. I'm also a fan, so it's like <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm fanboying out a little bit on this. I just uh, let me, I, just for transparency's sake. But let's roll. Let's be professional. Here we go. Yeah, yeah. Whatever that is, totally. <laughs> for, for folks that that don't know you, that aren't as familiar with your with your body of work, you want to give people just an introduction to to who you are and what you do. Yeah. So currently, I am a physician coach. I coach mostly emergency and critical care docs, some other specialists, actually some folks who are not in medicine as well, but mostly those who deal with critical situations. And I coach them on burnout, overwhelm, feeling stuck. You know, it's like, ah, I just feel this kind of lassitude, like I'm in the doldrums here. I don't have any wind in my sails. Where am I going? Career direction. I mean, there, there are many aspects of this, but some folks are feeling, man, I just, I don't love where I'm, where I am or where I'm going, or I don't know where I'm going. And so they come to me and we work through that. So I am a physician coach. I mean, I guess if you would say the title would be executive coach, but the way that my partner and I have started to construct it, it is very specific for physician coaching. And the other half of my time, I produce the stimulus podcast, which is I guess kind of the curriculum or the the offering to the world. <laughs> That's not quite the one-on-one coaching. And backing up, so I spent 21 years as an emergency doc. And I worked in the trauma of the trauma centers, <laughs> like as, as as you do, and teeny tiny little rural hospitals with curtains on the and sometimes you'd have curtains and just a couple of beds and everywhere in between. And I loved, loved the medicine. And I, st- I still love medicine. I don't. I haven't practiced for a few years because you know now I coaching is my full time job. But I love medicine. It was all the other stuff that went around it that I found to be so difficult. And I had three, whoa, pretty significant burnouts in the first ten years of my career. 
And I actually, I didn't really have any guidance. Thank mm-hmm. I got my wife was there. I mean, she she was really my my guy through it. <laughs> it was it was more of put yourself by the bootstraps, kid. <laughs> or you know, it was uh, it, she gave me some real sage wisdom. But those were really painful events, and I didn't have I didn't have a roadmap or a compass of wow, what should I do? Why why is this happening? I had to figure it out on my own. And the second half, the second ten or eleven years of my career were great because I kind of had figured out how to approach it, how to do it intentionally. And then when I stopped working, it was just, oh, I'm I'm doing this on my own terms because I want to do these other things. Whereas I when I was starting out as an attending, that's probably more than you're asking for. But now when I was starting out as attending, my wife and I met with our financial advisors. And this is, I think I was I was in year two and I was just, oh my gosh, how can I even last here? On my desk, I had the applications for anesthesia and ophthalmology. I was like, I got to get out of this ED. And it was, it was like, there was so much about, you know, the pace, the admin, the, the sense of loss of autonomy, all of the stuff that goes into, into burnout. I was like, I got to get out of here. And when I met with our financial advisors, I said, okay, well, what's your, what's your financial goal here? You know, what do you guys want to do in the long term? I said, I want to retire by 35, solid. And they just start laughing. I was like, wait, that wasn't a joke. I want to be out of here. And that was just how just intense it was. So according to the current time, that informs a lot of why I do what I do, because I know how that feels. And I was like, I want to learn how to you know, guide other people through that so that they can stay in the game. And that's actually, that is my main focus is helping docs stay in the game. There's, you know, who, not the main, but the, the most successful as far as clients and business and, and revenues that are coaches right now in medicine are, are career change coaches. Yeah. Docs <laughs> want to get out. So that's not my focus. When I have people who come to me for career change, I send them to specialists and that when docs want to stay in the game, that's what I do. Anyway, so long answer. That's no, that's a perfect place to jump off of because I, I think that the challenge is, you know, we talk a lot in the podcast about creating opportunities to succeed and to creating opportunities on your team and in your organization to be excellent, to have, to, to create excellence and to create the ability to sit in the pocket and perform at these ultra high levels. And we've been on an arc over the last few episodes where we've been talking about success or rather high performance, I won't really say success, but high performance as not just an individual skill set, but as an emergent property of the space and environment and team and organization around you. And I think that this actually is going to dovetail really nicely into that. Because what we haven't talked a lot about is what sort of you're describing, which is like, what are the things that you can modify in your universe to help create your local microenvironment such that it really allows you to stay in the game as long as you want and to be the type of doctor and the type of performer that you want to be. And I'll, I'll pause for a second and say that this isn't obviously just about physicians, although that's probably what we're going to spend a lot of the time talking about because that's who we are. But if you're listening to this and you're in another space, this also really applies to you, right? This is all about you sort of modifying your environment and looking ahead about what it's going to take for you to be there for the long run to keep getting whatever it is that your mission is, to keep getting that mission done over and over again. So let's dig into it like that, right? So so you started talking about how you had a bunch of burnout at the beginning. I guess the way I want to ask that question is, is what did that feel like from the inside? Did you know it was burnout? Did you have that vocabulary? Did you have that structure around it? Or was it just sort of a what the hell is this that I'm feeling kind of a thing? Mm, it was... The first time it was a, what is it? What the hell is this that I'm feeling? That was, it was around like 2000 or maybe mm-hmm. 2001. So I mean, burnout, the, definitely the nomenclature was out there, but it, it was not like it is now. And what it felt like was just a continual level of upregulation of sympathetic surge of stress, of anxiety. When I would drive into work, I would feel just utter dread and hmm. this tightness and acid in my my abdomen. And then as I approached work, I, I can feel it right now, I would get this tension in my neck and it felt, it kind of felt like I was drowning because the issues that were there, I kept taking the same approach to them and <laughs> getting the same results. And, you know, kind of that your mouth is just 
just going above the water, but you're taken on water. And that there was just no way out of this, you know? And there was the other aspect when you're a high level performer, especially when you put in the training that a physician does, is that sunk cost fallacy and also that sunk cost monkey that you carry on your back that I put all of those years into training for this, for this. And now I'm a year into it and I want, oh gosh, I mean, what does that say about me? Am I incompetent? And there's so much inner criticism that goes along with that. So it alternates between really heightened upregulation, the sympathetic surge. And also there's aspects of collapse in there, just oh, utter, just, I don't know if I can do this. And the word, the refrain that I would feel each time that it happened, each time that I experienced the burnout was, yeah, I mean, there, we can go into the actual definition, but this, here's, here's what it feels like is this is not sustainable. Every time it happened, I, I would, I'd say it out loud. I'd say, this is not sustainable. Ooh, and the canary has stopped singing. Time to do something. Mm. Mm. It's interesting because the way you're describing that, you know, there, there's this description of, for folks that perform in and out of emergencies or, or folks that perform in these really high stakes, must not fail environments, there's a concept of like allostatic load, right? Like you're always carrying a certain amount of weight even yeah. when you're not spiking up for a particular performance. But that there's really, you're almost identifying like two different sets of feelings that go into that. There is the constant feeling, the allostatic load piece, and then the extra piece that comes on as your, and what you're describing is the most common way that I've heard it described, like on the way into the shift. Yeah. It's interesting. Most most people don't describe that once they actually get there, right? So because true. So once true. Once you start going, once you put your stethoscope on and you get to work, you've trained your brain and your body so well to respond and and like spin up and be ready to actually handle whatever comes in that you let go of some of that stuff. And there's this paradoxical sense of peace that happens, right? Like you almost want to be there because life makes sense when you are there. It's everything else that doesn't make sense or, or you don't really have the ability to come down from it, which is a fascinating version of the stories that we tell ourselves, right? Because somehow we tell ourselves the story that this is okay, that this is okay to be here. And it's really just the drive in that is like, oh man, I feel what you're describing so viscerally. I've had that <laughs> drive in before. And I'm sure that 99% of the people listening to this podcast, you're like, oh yeah, I know what that drive in feels like. <laughs> You know, whatever you're driving into or sinking up to, it's like the moment before you're really getting ready to do it. But there's really those two phases to it. Huh. Yeah. That, that, I, I love that term, the allostatic load. I, had, I hadn't heard that before. And, you know, and as you were talking, as you were reflecting on what I said, I, I said, yeah, you know, when you get there, so you walk in the door and the charge nurse says, hey, there's a cardiac arrest coming in in 30 seconds. Boom, done, on. And it's go time and you're not feeling, oh, I'm sober now. It's not sustainable. It's like, oh yeah, this is my job. I'm doing it. But there are times on the shift when there's just, you know, there's overwhelm, you know, the patient load is just so much. A charge nurse is on you. There's, you know, you've got a thousand points of data to interpret and all these discharges and all these things to do at once. There's only one on you. And that's kind of this allostatic load, I guess, uh, on top of the allostatic load. But I, I had a thought pop into my mind when you were talking about that moment. And actually, I could see in your facial inflection, uh, your, 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 so your, your facial expression, as you're describing it, when you're talking about the drive into work, it was, it was very heavy. And then when you talked into work, there was kind of a, a lightness of being. And when we talk about, say, trauma stewardship, how do we integrate trauma, our own trauma? You know, especially if you're doing emergency work, you see just horrible stuff. And you know, you experience that, that kind of trauma and you also have your own difficulties. And there's a lot of different strategies to integrate that trauma rather than disintegrate. You know, when you integrate it, it's like, okay, I'm going to be all right. When you disintegrate it, then it accumulates, right? The difference between stress, which is resolved after the event and trauma, which you keep stuffing in there like a stuff sack. And two of the key elements to integrating trauma going forward, and I mean, trauma is such a complex topic, are action 
and community. So when you are able to take action or when you have agency, it doesn't even have to be like a thing you do. It can be a mindset or a thing that you think. That increases the chances of you being able to integrate that trauma, of you being able to really, I love that when you get into surfing on your show and it's like, it's like to surf that wave, right? You surf the wave rather than getting pushed under and pushed under. So there's action and then there's community. And when you're there in the, whatever is your environment, you're immersed in it. And it's like when you're in residency, you're forced to be immersed. It's kind of, it's a constructed around you. And then once you get out of residency, you kind of lose that community. And you know, a lot of docs, a lot of docs I, I speak with really lament that, that boy, in res- it was core to spree in residency, but now it's just, everybody just kind of punches the clock. All they want to talk about is money at the monthly meeting and nobody gets together. It's not all like that. But I, I'm just thinking that when you get to that ED, it's instant action instant community. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is it is instant community because you're dropped into a team that has to solve a very specific problem set. And we most of us that work in these types of worlds are self-selected good at and enjoy solving problem sets. Right? That's what we that's what we do. That's how we define ourselves. And so there's a couple of like interwoven threads in here that are worth pulling on. One is work as identity. Right. And there's Mm. some name for that that I'm blanking on identification or something or facet something. Anyway, it's basically the idea that you define your entire identity as one facet of what you do or who you are. Right. So I am Dan the doctor. At least that's how I used to think about myself for a long time, especially before I got so involved in in building out the emergency mind project and the community around it. But identification makes it very challenging for you to dig at some of these deeper things that are going on. The second thing is that we teach people a lot how to do that first moment, right? We teach you're standing in the ER, you're standing there with your scrubs on and your stethoscope on, and a cardiac arrest is incoming five minutes. What are you going to do, right? And that's like always how we ask it. Like we're sitting around talking to each other, like, okay, incoming ETA three minutes. What are you going to do, man? What are you going to do, right? (laughs) And then we train ourselves to be like, whoa, this is what I'm going to do, right? I'm going to do this and sign up. Yeah. But we don't train how to do everything else. Mm. We don't train how to tackle the drive in. We don't train how to tackle the drive home. We don't train how to tackle the day off to really reset and start digging into a lot of this stuff, right? And this was one of the big realizations for me when I started doing this project was I was thinking perform, perform, perform. And now I see this in this much broader context of prepare, perform, recover, and evolve, right? And you have to train the other sides of it as well. Because if you just focus on that moment of spinning up for the cardiac arrest, you're going to do the cardiac arrest. You probably won't do it as well as you could otherwise, but you're going to do it. But the rest of you is going to fall apart while you're doing that. And I think that there's just so much in there that we don't do, maybe because it's hard and we don't know how to do it. Maybe because we're just now starting to think a little bit about it. I don't really know. I don't know. Can I pull on a thread? of a thread totally. that you just pulled on because you talked about identity. And I think that is something that I think you and I have, uh, we've never talked about it before, but hmm. I think really looked into. And when I speak with docs who are thinking about retiring or maybe changing careers, I said in the beginning, I didn't do much of that, but you know, it's, it's, it's a thought or maybe they need to go into disability. And so much of their identity is tied up in being the doctor. I mean, it's pretty awesome. You know, even though, you know, there's all this stuff of you know, the incivility and expectations and kind of this changing dynamic with patients and administration, but still being a doctor is a, like having that be what you tell people you do is amazing. But there's some questions to ask yourself, even now, you know, if you're in the thick of it, and yeah, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm partway through my career. I, I got years, years to go. So the first question is, what does that mean to you? You know, what is being a physician or X or a CEO? What does that mean to you? Because clearly it means something and it, it can mean different things to different people. Being a healer, helping those in need, providing for my family, public health advocate. I'm a lifesaver. I'm a scientist, a resuscitationist. I'm a teacher. I'm a student. I mean, there's all these things that, that when you say it, come up. 
And then it's like, all right, that's great. You know, it's, uh, let's, let's pump it out. Like, so then the next question is, well, what's beneficial about that identity? And, you know, you get credibility and stature and, and it opens doors. And, and I, I, I want to give credit where credit's due. I, I had thought about this in the very abstract and I learned all of this from Heather Fork and she's a, she's a coach who, who works with docs through career change. So, but I, I, just, I love this framework. So what does it mean to you? What's beneficial about your identity? And right, how does it fuel you? And it's okay to fuel you, you know? I mean, it's pretty awesome. But then here's the other side of that. How does this identity trap you? Or how does this get in the way? And another way to look at it is, what do you think that you can't do because of this identity? Or what do you think that you can't do because of how you see yourself? And there are these buckets of our lives, what we do and who we are, but sometimes, you know, the, the lines really overlap and the Venn diagram, I mean, there can almost be total eclipse for some, mm-hmm. you know, like the, the physicians of old, uh, a couple of generations ago, I mean, that was it. I, me, my dad, lawyer, identity, human being, lawyer. And he loved it. I mean, he was a, his great dad. Awesome. He, a, such a magnanimous human being. But it's cool. It's like in that generation, that's just didn't think about this stuff. It was just, yeah, that's who I am. And you think about that's like, okay, how does this trap me? Or what, what do I think that I can't do because of this? And then what's missing in your identity that you'd like to cultivate? Yeah. <laughs> right. It's uh, you know, what, what is that? What's the ideal that you see in you that you would like to grow? Because especially, man, when you've been working for years, it, it becomes a little stagnant. You know, you're kind of doing the same thing. It's, I'm trying to think of whatever movie montage this is. I had like a thousand movie montages of like doing the same thing <laughs> yeah, over and over totally. again. But do I want to be a, a musician? Do I want to be a writer? Do I want to start, you know, like your incredible teams project that, that you've got going? It's just, and these things take risk. And it's kind of, what is that? Melissa, my, my wife, Melissa, listens to this. What is it? Called? It's called We Can Do Hard Things. It's Glennon Doyle. And I, I love the name of that podcast. We can do hard things, but that's a hard thing. Say, oh, I'm going to extend myself beyond what I am now. Just intentionally doing that. It takes courage and some, it takes some prompting. It takes, but what really what it takes is intention that, yeah, I'm going to explore this and I'm going to cultivate this. Yeah, totally. I have been fortunate enough when I'm working with folks, usually in my other hat under the Mission Critical Teams Institute, to work with some folks that are coming towards a transition in their career in the military as they're moving from one space to another space. Mm. And I think that's another very parallel universe to what you're describing, right? Where your identity and what you've been doing and how you've been living your life for such amount of time has been in this space. And then you're shifting roles and shifting realities. And there's ways where that works wonderfully. And there's ways where that's really not so great in a lot of senses. And I think to continue the mission critical bent for a moment, you know, a lot of what you're describing with the stuff that happens that builds up, to use our framework about that, is residue, right? The word that we use at mission critical is residue. Residue is not in and of itself bad or good. It is just the natural karmic process of what happens when you execute a thing over time, right? It's the, you know, you pick up one end of the stick and the other end of the stick moves. You do hard things, residue builds up. It's not good or bad. It just is. You're not broken because you have it. You're not a victim because you have it. It just is what it is. And you have to process it in one way or the other. And how you process it really determines whether it gunks up all of your work or if it becomes fuel for you to build the next generation of yourself. And there is such a strength in viewing it that way. And it also takes a lot of work and it's a pretty high lift to look at it that way the first time, especially if the first time you're looking at it is when you already have a huge stack of it built up inside of everything that's going on. And you're like, is how is this fuel? Is this really fuel? What I'm looking at here is like the combined, like, you know, bullshit over the last period of time that I've never really like sat down and dealt with. And you're right that it is hard things to think about identity. I think that identity is such a, a core component of who we are. I mean, that's a ridiculous thing to say. Like, of course it is. 
but as <laughs> as elite performers, right? When we think yeah. about like what it takes to be an elite performer, like those visions of ourselves, those beliefs we have about ourselves and who we are and what we do are such the underlying pillars of what it takes to to actually perform and to do the things that we want to do. It's hard to look at those. It's hard to disentangle those. You know, you do have to do hard things to start reshaping those in the way that you want it to be. Thankfully, if you're listening to this podcast, you like doing hard things, right? You're here because you have skills at doing hard things. You're not afraid yeah. of hard things. Whether that hard thing is looking inward or looking outward and, you know, accomplishing some objective, like it takes work and it takes digging. The way that you're describing it, where you're focused on what are the parts of this that push me forward and where do I want to be going with it? Like what are the strengths and weaknesses of this approach? I think are really, really important. When you're talking about the, you know, people in the military making this mm -hmm. transition or people in medicine sure. making transition or people in sports making transition. I get asked this a lot. You know, I, I don't practice clinical medicine anymore. And just a lot of us, wow, like how do you not do it? Don't you feel like you wasted all that time now? And it took me a while to kind of figure this out is that no way. And I, so that was an incredible experience, but it's part of me. All of that training is a part of me. All of those years are part of me. All that experience, all of the hard things, all of the suffering is a part of me. All of the knowledge and the skills and the learning, that's all, all part of me. All that, the, the hundred thousand patients. And I could not do what I do now in the way that I do it without all of that stuff. You know, without going to med school and residency and seeing all those patients and having all those experiences. And it's just, you know, so I'd say quite the opposite that, and there, actually there was, I had a really painful moment in my life, which kind of opened this up. And I don't know if I would have been able to, to, to see it before that, but it's just the opposite that all of the things came before that just informs how I do it. If I was a barista and who knows? Not much of a coffee fan, but I would take all of those things with me in how I approach that and how I, how I interact with people and understand people and approach my job and, you know, dedication and tenacity. And how do I, how do I try to achieve mastery and making that beautiful tree on top of the milk? It's just a part of me. So if I can de-identify that that is who I am then that allows that freedom to, to, to move on and grow. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, there are a lot of examples. So really, what you're sort of describing is like decomposing your sense of identity into a little bit of like, what are the underlying pillars underneath it, right? What are the things sure. that sort That's of perfect. Like, yeah. that like, what are the, the notes that form the chord or whatever it is, right? That like gets you what you're doing, Yeah. right? And you're trying to find those things and be like, okay, well, maybe as I transition, I'm not doing this. I'm instead going to do this. Right. But I'm still sounding that same note. It's just going to form the bass note of a different chord. I don't really know how music works, but I'm pretty sure chords have bass notes. So I think that, I think that analogy is <laughs> going to fly. Let's just go with it. Totally. Please feel free to correct me if anybody knows better. Knows the, better. The, uh, the, the letters, the letters will be, uh, stuff in your inbox. <laughs> That'd be awesome. In any case. So, you know, there are a lot of examples of folks that have made really successful pivots and really successful sort of changes to what they're doing while honoring the parts of them that have grown in phase one, even as they move on to phase two. But let's regroup for a second because okay. you're doing a lot more on folks that want to stay doing what they're doing. Yeah. But want to make it better and more fulfilling and more doable, for lack of a better word for it. And, and I think this is going to point us towards a, a missing piece because we've talked so much about the environment and performance as an emergent property of it. But we've talked very little in large senses about modifying your environment and doing what you can to, to augment and support that. So take me down that path a little bit. What does that look like for folks that are in a hard space, doing a hard thing and want to keep being in a hard space, doing a hard thing that's the same hard thing in the same hard space, but better? So there's a lot of different ways to approach this. There's different frameworks. There's different, it's, it's, it's kind of like we're looking for the one universal equation that explains everything in the universe. There's like the strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force. And, and there's just different aspects to this. And I say that because 
a different, let's just, should we like performer or operator or doctor or whoever comes to the situation with different challenges? Mm -hmm. Let's just, let's talk something as easy as pace. Just, you know, if you're working in an emergency department, pace is, you know, really going to be a thing. And depending on where you work, the pace will be higher or low. You can never control the pace truly. Some docs love it and they, they just want it busier and busier and busier. And some collapse and are crushed by it. And so for them, one of, for one of them, it, it'll kind of be like accumulated trauma. And for the other, it's just, oh, I mean, this is a job I signed up for. I love this. So that's just one example of how different people come to things differently. Uh, and if we look at the, the big picture, there's, there's a couple of aspects to this. One is where do you have agency? It's so important. There's a, when I, I, I do a, we were talking about assessments, you know, you're, 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 deve- I don't, I don't know if I'm, if I'm talking out of school, but you're developing some assessments that are, you know, super cool for teams and all this. And I, I have an assessment I do for clients and we're like looking at their, their job. And if what's, what's the genie job, if a genie could snap their fingers and make the, the perfect job for you, what would that look like? And just get into the great detail and crazy, crazy detail. I, I learned this from my, uh, my, my coaching mentor. And so make it as beautiful and awesome as possible. And then Look at your current job. How much overlap is there in the Venn diagram? And it's a subjective thing. And, you know, I was, I was talking to somebody last week and, and they said, they're not even in the same room. <laughs> there's, there's, so, there's this overlap. And, and then the question is, well, what's one thing that you can change to increase that overlap? And at first, you think, well, there's nothing in this place. There is nothing that I can do. Well, if that's true, then find a new job, period. But usually there is something that you can do. There is agency and you can find it in really unexpected places. And we think of agency just in the realm of professional. Okay, what can I do in work right now? But really there's... When we're say we're, we're talking about your experience at work or dealing with stress, there's three realms where you need to focus or, or, or will focus. There's the personal, there's the professional, and then there's the systems. And so we don't often think about the personal realm of a place where you have just abundant agency. I mean, it's just there in droves. It's, it's like being below sea level with oxygen. And I think, okay, how, what, what can I do to make sure that my relationships are fulfilling and I support them and I do the things that are fulfilling to me? That's the foundation. And then in the professional realm, okay, that, that was, that's mostly where I operate. Although, you know, we do get into the, to the other realms. In the professional realm, what's going on that is really just not working to me or is increasing this allostatic load. Some of it you just can't control. And this is pure stoicism. What is it that's in my control? And I want to give an example of, a, a, if I can tell a story that I think is, is so interesting to this, where you think that there's going to be no agency, but the transformation that this doc made on her own was just, it still shocks me to this day how incredible it was. So, she came and with 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 permission to to share the story. So she came to coaching because she wanted out, 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 out. She didn't know what she just that's what she knew. And I said, well, why? Because nobody appreciates anybody. It's the the patients don't appreciate the doctors, the staff, and here like nobody appreciates anybody. I'm like, oh, well, boy, seems we're at an impasse here. You know, <laughs> nothing you can do. Well, not true. Because if it's appreciation that is the issue, there's really only two things that you can do. You can act in a way that's worthy of appreciation or you can be fully present 
when appreciation happens. Because you and I both know that you get thanked a lot at work and you kind of just let it roll off and you don't pay attention to it. So if that's what you need, if that's your sunshine and water, then let's make a challenge that the next time you go to work, you are like the like a SETI telescope with those, like, what I think it's or, uh, the large, very large array with like 50 satellite dishes, super sensitive, that you are going to be open to accepting gratitude from your patients and the staff. And there was kind of, hmm, all right, well, I don't think there's much gratitude there. I don't think, you know. And then a couple weeks later, met again. And it was just, whoa, 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 whoa. This was incredible. And, you know, she put in the effort and found it in almost every patient interaction, these, these little shards of gratitude. And, and then she just took it like a, you know, like do, doing a 99 yard football run from end zone to end zone and said, you know, I'm going to start a gratitude project in my ED. Mm. And so anytime she heard gratitude from a patient about someone else, she would bring that person into the room and then made a point of doing that with staff and then would thank everyone before leaving. You know, that's a common thing like, hey guys, thanks, but really one-on-one, face-to-face. And then started t- telling people about this project that, hey, this is what I'm doing. And it started to create culture change within that ED. Mm. And so you go from this point, like it, it's, it's hopeless, it's anger, it's frustration of there's no gratitude here to where do I have control? Where is my agency? And I mean, she, I mean, she, she just like went full, like turned it up to 11 with that. And it, and it was transformative that going from that pit of acid going to work because there was no appreciation and there was incivility to, this is going to be awesome. I cannot wait. I cannot wait to get in there and do this and just be receptive to these moments. It's awesome. That is, we talk sometimes about like the idea of, uh, of the leave no trace principles, right? Like you leave the you leave the campsite better than or at worst equal to how you found it. And there's a, a group of folks I talk to at work in my shop about this, about leave no trace emergency medicine. The idea that, that and I'm not talking about the patients here who you should also try to leave better than when you found them as much as possible, but I'm actually talking about the department and the hospital and the community as a whole, mm-hmm. which is that for every shift, you should leave it and you should leave it a better place than how you found it. Mm-hmm. That is like both a hard thing to do sometimes when you're under pressure, but also an easy thing to do because it doesn't really take that much to to nudge the environment to be slightly better than when you found it. My favorite example of this was we had a really squeaky door in the resuscitation bay and we were able to get some WD-40 and fix it the other day. And like, does that matter? Like, like there were patients, you know, going into cardiac arrest and in between that, we would be like fixing... We wouldn't leave the patient's room in cardiac arrest to fix the door, clearly. We would we would stay with the patient and take care of them. But when there was a lull, we would be like, all right, well, well now we have this can of WD-40. I don't know. What else can we fix with it? And yeah. it became this mission of like, well, I don't know. Let's go fix all the squeaky things today. And like, th- th- there's a sense like th- the counterpoint to that and the the sort of bitter counterpoint to that is like, are you rearranging deck chairs on a Titanic, right? Or are you actually doing a better job with the lifeboats that you have? And I think that's a valid critique, and I think it's worth finding out that balance for for yourself in there, but at least to ask the question of, what is it going to take for me today on this next shift, in this next operation, in this next whatever, to leave my community and environment 1% better than how I found it? Okay. That is... Can I steal that? Yeah, sure. Uh, oh, I love that. And I, I love it. So so my, my partner and I said, so, Scott Weingart, we, uh, we have a coaching practice together. We're starting a course and one of the parts of the course has to do with things like this, you know, flow games. Mm -hmm. You come into that ED and you have one focus, one thing to make it a game, right? That's almost a game of, I am, I'm WD-40 doc. And, you know, the gratitude thing, that's also a game. Or I want to leave every patient encounter 
with me and them better off or you know i'm going to you know do this with these or whatever whatever flow game that is and it's so so rare to feel that kind of that fun you know you feel it when you're a resident but you you lose it when you're attending because you're just going through the work and that, i don't know that that WD, I, you know, I'm realizing now it was a totally shameless plug for for our, our course, but I'm okay no, it's with it. Good, that. totally yeah. fine. Flame proof people, watch out for it in the fall. Take <laughs> the flame proof course. So, this WD40 doc thing, mm-hmm. how different? You know, it's like you you walk into a shift with a can of WD40, and here is your intent to spray lube on every squeaky thing that is non human. That you here in that ED is kind of like you've just made a game of something which seems very ungame like. And your experience at the end of the day, if you do that one shift or two shifts, like the um like that James Clear graph of mm-hmm. uh, of habits that yeah, after a exactly year, writing. yeah, yeah, after a year, you're you're just the way that you feel about your job is massively different. Yeah, and I, I so I can't. Uh, this next sentence I can't prove, right? I can't prove that teams that fix small things and find ways to fix small things outperform teams that don't. I can't prove that. But I am sure as anything that that is true, right? And if you give me a choice to be on a team where they accept and grumble about friction, or if they go out and proactively try to smooth out, like take this all uh, on the plane and yeah. sort of get to work on their environment, I will pick that team every time. And where that team doesn't exist or where I'm not offered that choice, I will build that choice into the teams that I'm part of, right? And so much so that people get sick of me talking about this stuff sometimes at work. And I'm sorry that they're sick of it. And I'm going to keep doing it anyway, which is that I think we're going to keep sort of slowly molding the environment around us because I believe that a better environment creates the space for better performance to emerge. Like there's this whole virtuous cycle about that. Ask your team's question. I, it just it can't, when you're talking about the, you know, like what are you going to do about friction? Are we going to get after it, or are we going to complain about it? And it's just when, first off, if you if you sit next to someone at work who is a continual complainer, I mean, it's just like it, it is just a, a joy leech off of you. Have you read Extreme Ownership? Mm-hmm. Think about that principle. Like when you, I mean, you work with teams so much, and you know people actually embracing that. And I think like as, a, as an individual, you know, when I would be in the ED and think, or, or even now that, okay, if I'm asking someone to do something and they are not doing it right, I need to take ownership that I need to guide them so that they do it right. So as an individual, I, I, it's incredibly empowering, but I wonder, is, is that a principle that you bring into teams that everyone here has full ownership of the outcome? Or is that, is that a little bit too, too aggro? I, I mean, I, I really, I really love the book, and I love a lot of the stuff that that Jocko and his team produce, and their their group Echelon Front's amazing. And they're, you know, if you haven't if you haven't thought through or read or listened to Jocko's thing on good, you should immediately go do that because yes. it's, it's incredible. That mantra that when when I would get overwhelmed in the ED, mm-hmm. that was my reset. That was my affirmation phrase. Was yeah, good. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, I think it's incredible and, and incredibly empowering for folks that work in the types of universes that we work in. There are times when that's the right mental model to take into spaces and there's, there's times when it's not. Right. And, and I think like this is a really important time to draw a distinction between performance and outcome. Right. We, you know, we had a, a case the other day. We had a very, very young child in cardiac arrest. And came in relatively unexpectedly, and we we weren't able to save the child, but we performed at an absolutely stellar level, and my team did a great job. We worked on this kid with everything that we had, and we brought the cutting edge of human science to bear for that family, and it wasn't enough to save the child. So... There are lots of times when we're working in these spaces where the outcome is not within our control or not controllable by us or any human being, 
And I think that 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 becomes a little bit that can become a problem if you don't approach it the right way. Starting from this idea of I own the space and the teams around me. The positive side of that is that there is nobody on the team who cannot make the team and the environment better. Right? Each can lead, all can follow. We can all move forward and make it better as we keep going through it. And I think that there's a lot of strength and virtue in that. I have seen that go awry sometimes when the process outcome thing isn't really clearly sort of talked about. One of the hard things to realize in emergency medicine or any, I guess, any any time when you are doing kind of that critical work where a catastrophic outcome is a reality Mm -hmm. is you do your best. And this is a, this is a, a friend of mine who was a, was an absolute nihilist with the EDT talk. And he say, Hey man, I'm going to go in, make people happy, treat them well, do my best. But sometimes I'm just a speed bump on their trip to death. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's, it's very, uh, it's dark, it's dark, it's dark but, but it's true. Mm. You know? Yeah. There, there's lots that we don't control. And, and to me, the, you know, the, the flip side of that question is like, what do you do with that suffering? Right. And we've talked, we've talked multiple times across multiple different platforms about this idea of not wasting suffering. And I think that's the charge from there is do you, you know, do you approach that case and let it go? Or do you approach the case and leverage that and build your team and make your team and your universe slightly better as a result of having had that interaction? Even when it is hard and terrible and there's you know, th- there's nothing light or good about a young child dying like that. Like it's just brutal. No. Oh, it's horrible. But That's there is horrible. also the choice of what to do yeah. with that. So this gets back to that idea of how do you integrate these events? Mm-hmm. You know, first off, isolation. No, no. Make sure that you have a community of support. And then action. You know, we're talking about debriefing after action reports, all of these things. Let me review what I did. How do I learn? How do I improve? That's all action. But another thing that when we're talking about the suffering and the feeling of suffering is to not run away from it Mm. and not shun it. Because when we do that, it's still there. And it kind of gets packed away. And having awareness, just awareness that I'm having this feeling, accepting that I'm having this feeling, that I'm having this thought, I'm having this physiologic reaction. And there's a, there's a book, Pema Chodron, Welcoming the Unwelcome. Could much be more unwelcome than the event that you describe? I mean, that's just, I remember every child who died through 20 years. It's just, I mean, few and far between are, and even ones that didn't. It's just really hard. And so when you feel these things, feel it. So here comes this thought. And then here comes this reaction, this physiologic, you know, where do you feel it? So when you feel that thought, and this was um, one of the frameworks that she had in her book, and how do you accept it? That's a, that's a really abstract idea is, well, just ignore the thought for a minute, just kind of put it up on the shelf and focus on what you feel physically, what you feel, where do you feel it? Where is it in your body? And just sit with that for a minute. Is it tightness in the chest and the jaw and the shoulders? Is it a flushing? Is it a sinking feeling? All right. That's where I feel. I'm feeling it right, right, right now as I think about it. I'm feeling it as a kind of a constriction in my chest, like around my epigastrium and my xiphoid. And then embrace that. Embrace that feeling. This is this is very much a you know akin to meditation that you're you know just having you're having awareness. But the, it's this next step of embracing it and sending it warmth. Send that feeling warmth which in itself can sound like an abstraction. And a a way to think about this is like a child having a tantrum. You know, you're sort of having your own tantrum or storm or tempest. And if a child was having a tantrum, really, they kind of need a hug. 
they don't need to yell at or a shouldn't or a should, should, you know, you know, should all over your side. I shouldn't feel this way. I shouldn't have done this. It's just, I am feeling this way. So let me embrace that. Let me just sit with it. And you're not embracing it to change anything. You know, we think like, I need to change this. I don't want to feel this way. Hey man, f- you, you can't control that. Feelings meant to be felt for better or worse. And then you just sit with it for a while longer. Sit with that. If you need to recalibrate, I know you've talked about breathing quite a bit, whatever, a box breath, a deep breath, a in four, hold seven, out for eight, a double in and a sigh. Did, have you heard about where that came from? That from, from crying children? I, when, no, I didn't realize that's from. I, 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 I read this. Yeah. I, it was an interview with, um, uh, who's the guy? Uh, Huberman. Yeah, talked about that. And I, and I don't know if he said or someone said, said, yeah, they realize that when ch- crying children are trying to soothe themselves or recover from a cry, it's uh, I'm not, it's like, well, maybe there's something to it. That's so really interesting. whatever it is that you need to regulate because you're, you know, you're going to be upregulated. You've, this is, this is an allostatic load. Just to, to regulate and to downregulate, take that tachometer down from red line to just below with this regulation. And then if you need to, or if you want to, you can recalibrate. How can I frame this? What can I do? How do I want to show up for myself? And that's all just that one thought and that one reaction that if we let it go, or we just try to push it away, or I don't want to feel this can add up. And with people who are in you know, high, high performance jobs, you know, we're talking about emergency docs and critical care docs and trauma surgeons, even, you know, I know you, you work with athletes and high performers and you even work with esports teams, you know, you're all of it. They also can experience these things. I mean, it's not exclusive to when you're dealing with life and death. So you have that awareness, that acceptance, that just regulation, and then recalibrate. Should you, should you feel the need to help process, to help take action after that event. Love it. I absolutely love it. That's just like a, a master class in processing a feeling right there. Thank you for that. I can't believe it, but we're, we're basically at an hour already of having done this, which is, which is insane. It feels like we just got started, but I want to give you a chance to yeah. close out and give folks a challenge. What do you want them to do differently after listening to this, whether they're starting a shift or new operation or whatever it is? What do you want them to take away from this and try and experiment with? Let me think on that for a second, because there's so many different challenges. (laughs) Because let's let's see, I'm I'm just I'm just going to think out loud. Yeah, because there is because there's agency, because there's also what we just talked about. You know, expanding the space between stimulus and response and processing those feelings and. And and I'll say that for the for that sometimes it's reflective processing. It's hard to do it like in the moment when you're in the code room. Yeah, sometimes it yeah. needs to happen afterwards. You know, I'm gonna offer the challenge, <laughs> inspired by you, of the flow game. Your next shift. What is one thing that you can focus on to make it a game, to make it fun? And it could be the accepting gratitude. It could be everyone I meet, my intent is to, you know, make them feel better or have compassion or, you know, learn something new on each patient. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's going in there with that intention to do it through the whole shift and see if you can gamify it, bring a little bit of levity to it, a little bit of fun to it. So that it's not rote and it's not just you and I both know that when people go into their shift, sometimes, all right, hitting the salt mine. I don't know why the emergency department is called the salt mine. It's, trust me, salt mines are much worse. I've, you know, at least what I've seen on Wikipedia. But that's what it is. So what is the flow game that you can apply to awesome. that one next shift? Awesome. Rob, thank you so much for coming to the podcast. Totally delighted to have you. Dan, this was a treat. And we had no roadmap to start this off. It was just (laughs) from the word go. And I feel like we've got about 18 more hours of conversation we got to get through. So 
this was this was a an, an honor and a delight, and I'm really grateful that you had me on the show. All right, folks, that brings us to the end of this episode. I hope you learned something, and I hope you enjoyed. As always on this podcast, our goal is to dive deep into what it takes to perform under pressure. Nothing that we discuss here should be construed as medical advice, and all of the opinions that we discuss are our own and are not necessarily representative of any organization with which we were affiliated or for whom we work. If you want to go even deeper and get more involved, don't forget to check out our book. It's called The Emergency Mind, Wiring Your Brain for Performance Under Pressure, and you can find it at emergencymind.com book. All right. Good luck out there.